Good morning, folks. Happy Wednesday morning. It's sunny, cold, yes, but sunny. And I think we have a little, there's a little momentum in town called uh, Cambridge uh, Fundraiser. And it's not a fundraiser, it's a fundraiser. And you're supposed to take a picture of yourself at the beach today or in your beach attire in your backyard. So if you've got a pool or your neighbor has, put your uh, bathing suit on, hop over the fence and uh, take a picture of yourself uh, trying to get through the ice in their pool. I'm sure they'd appreciate that, but uh, it'll be a lot of fun anyway. Um, this morning, we're, um, as promised, uh, of course, I have, uh, we have uh, the Honourable Perrin Beatty, the President and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, but I want to give you a little bit of highlight on, on Perrin. And uh, he received his BA from Western Ontario. He was first elected to the House of Commons in 1972 at the age of 22 and in 79 became the youngest ever appointed to cabinet by Prime Minister Clark. In 1984, when Brian Mulroney led uh, the Tories to victory, he became the Minister of National Revenue and subsequently held the posts of Solicitor General, Minister of National Defense, Minister of National Health and Welfare. And following the 93 leadership race, he was appointed Secretary of State for External Affairs by the uh, uh, Prime Minister, um, uh, uh, Kim Campbell. And in 1995, Prime Minister uh, Jean Chrétien appointed him President and CEO of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And in 99, he became President and CEO of the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters Association. And the fondest day of his life was in August of 2007, when he took the role as President and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and got to work with me ever since. Uh, he is an officer of the Order of Canada and maybe and I'm not sure about this, he could maybe expand on it, but I suspect one of his many prized honors bestowed was when the Japanese government presented him with the Order of the Rising Sun. Many, in, and in fact, most people of the day who followed his impact in Parliament as a critical player in the very life we have today in our country would say, Perrin Beatty is the best prime minister we never had. Folks, please welcome to Chamber Chat, my friend, the Honourable Perrin Beatty. Perrin, good morning. Good morning, Greg. I, I think the expression was actually, thank God Perrin Beatty was never Prime Minister. <laughs> I think you may have gotten it wrong. And the most, and, and the best day of my life was not taking over the Chamber Presidency. As you know, I'm from Fergus. Best day of my life was discovering the banana cake at the Naughty Pine in Preston. <laughs> yeah. I'm missing that. For sure. Um, thanks very much for being here this morning, uh, Perrin. I think, um, you know, there's obviously, you know, because you've been every single day working on uh, uh, issues around business and COVID-19 and business disruption and government disruption. Um, you know, I think maybe from your perspective, maybe at a very high level, what, what, what do you think we in the business association community, but even in business, are going to be the one thing we're always going to remember about this past year? I think perhaps more than anything else, the, the need for us to be prepared and for us to be able to innovate very rapidly. Um, I think what's been stunning to me this past year is how quickly businesses have rethought their business models, how they've looked at uh, how they can work from remotely, for example, or how restaurants or, or retail operators can, uh, can reinvent themselves. It's been quite extraordinary. The government itself was bowled over when they called for manufacturers who would be willing to to uh, produce PPEs, and over 5,000 people got in touch with them immediately. Uh, it shows something about the adaptability of the business sector and under the hardest of circumstances. Do you think that, um, um, from your perspective, do you, do you think that the lessons learned here will be enduring to business going forward? Do you think that will will we'll really change the dynamic of how we uh, run our businesses, how we prepare our businesses, and, uh, and, and how we um, uh, look to technology to advance um, our productivity? You bet. Um, it, one, if there's a plus side to all of this, it's that I've had a chance to visit with more chambers and more CEOs across the country than in any previous year as a result of being able to do it virtually. I have yet to find a CEO who said to me that the company is going to look the same when we emerge from the tunnel as it did 
when they were going in. And that involves certainly uh, digitalization, where in the space of 10 months, we jumped about 10 years in terms of the impact of digital technologies. And so what we've seen is uh, the obvious is there and that, and that businesses are looking at uh, remote working, distributed workforces, for example, and that has significant implications for uh, both the nature of, of work in Canada and for the, the structure of businesses. But beyond that, uh, they've been looking at what new products can we offer and how can we rethink the, the business? Um, this time last year, Greg, if you uh, wanted to get your prescription refilled and you called uh, your doctor's office, you said, uh, hey, I can't do this over the phone. You've got to come in and see me. About two weeks later, you got an email from him saying, the one thing I don't want is for me to, for you to come anywhere near my office. We're going to do this remotely. If you look at telemedicine alone, and what has been done there with uh, TELUS and with uh, Shoppers Drug Mart and others getting very aggressively into the field, we are moving ahead dramatically. And, and that means that for people with disabilities, for um, the elderly, for people in rural and remote areas, that they'll have access to services that they just never could have had before. Same with telelearning. Um, you know, you look at the, at the universities and at Conestoga, in your area, and within the space of a week, they were all virtual. That's stunning uh, that you can convert a, an institution that rapidly. Yes, they'll be looking forward to having people back in person, but uh, but they're not going to give up what they've learned about about uh, being able to deliver services virtually. So it's going to cause us, it, it's accelerated a trend that was already there and that was the digitalization of society. Uh, what this is going to do is to, uh, is to make us rethink how we do business and it will create a whole new range of uh, successful companies and others who don't adapt will be left behind. You know, what's really interesting about that is you're, you know, such a huge champion on, on, uh, on uh, trade agreements globally. And, you know, we, we, we look at what the pandemic has done. It's, you know, it's basically pulled everybody back into the country. We just had a, uh, an announcement this morning here in the region of Waterloo out of our uh, Waterloo region airport, uh, where Flair Airlines is going to start um, regular flights. Um, I'll be able to come and visit you quite readily and uh, right here from home. And that's going to be wonderful. But um, you know, what's going to happen to the airline industry as we move forward? Because the adaptation of technology and for us to be able to use this and, you know, have group events and communication around the world, as you know, on our radio station, we've had people from Europe um, that, you know, through Zoom and, and uh, on the radio. Um, what's going to happen to that industry? Because that's a critical component uh, to trade. Um, and it's a critical component um, to um, uh, the movement of people as well. It is. And, and uh, it's a sector which is particularly hard hit and where I'm very worried about the, about the future of Canada's airlines unless we, we step in to assist them. And I'm worried about regional routes as well. Uh, we heard Air Canada earlier this week pulling some more flights as well. I was talking to, uh, to one of our members in Saskatchewan the other day. Uh, he was mentioning that, uh, you know, it's a five hour drive from where he is to Edmonton, but to fly, he might have to fly through Toronto to get to Edmonton uh, out of Saskatchewan and or through Calgary. And he said it would take eight hours or something to make the connection through uh, through Calgary. Um, it's it's very worrisome. If, if you look at the impact of the pandemic, it has uh, hit very unevenly. Some sectors have done very well through it. Um, Others have, have been particularly hard hit. Now, the hardest hit have been travel, tourism, the hospitality sector. Retail, obviously, is, is hard hit, but particularly in the hospitality sector, hotels, restaurants, and so on. And if you look at who is going to be the, uh, the slowest coming back, it's likely to be that sector as well. So with airlines who saw their business falling off by 95%, um, they have major fixed costs with their with their fleets and their staff and so on. And uh, they have been working very hard to try to maintain the operation. Uh, but we have to ask ourselves, what is the nature of this going to look like when, when we come back? Um, the fact is that I expect that that convention travel will continue to be off for a long time. So uh, 
big city hotels, downtown hotels that do the convention trade are probably really going to be feeling this. That means a lot of air travel as well uh, with that. We'll be seeing um, business travel coming back, but the simple fact is that, that Zoom is working so well that many of the, uh, of, of the trips that we would have made uh, physically at, at this time uh, last year, um, we will be making virtually. Uh, so it will come partly back. That's going to hit the airlines on a continuing basis. I think it's probably tourism that will come back faster, personal, uh, personal travel. So uh, we need to, uh, in Canada, make sure that, that we support the airlines, that uh, we continue to have Canadian airlines in Canada, and that regional routes uh, continue. Uh, you look, for example, one of the first routes that uh, Air Canada announced they were canceling was North Bay. When you have an announcement like that and you're sitting in North Bay, you realize how important an economic driver that airport is. And uh, it isn't a route that's going to come back quickly. Yeah, interesting. On uh, February the 2nd, you penned an op-ed and co-signed by 28 members of the medical and business communities called The Urgent Need for Widespread Rapid Testing. You've repeatedly made the statement and you've made it to me personally as well, lockdowns are not the answer. Uh, share the context of that op-ed, if you don't mind, and 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 really where you know maybe we fell down um, in through this pandemic and not getting that rapid testing out. It's odd that yesterday I think the prime minister made the announcement that rapid testing is you know needs to be rolled out. It's the, it's the way to reduce transmission, and yet we're you know 11 months into this. It you know lockdowns aren't the answer. <clears throat> lockdowns are a tool. They're a so-called circuit breaker. And anytime you have a lockdown, it's proof that you failed. Uh, because what, what you're doing is you're saying, this is spiraling out of control. The only thing that we can do is to confine people at home until we, till we get this under some semblance of control. The, the problem from the outset with this has been that governments have been in reactive mode throughout. Instead of managing the pandemic, recognizing the fact that it wasn't going to go away anytime soon, but that we had to target our resources at places like, um, like long-term care facilities or, or persons with uh, pre-existing conditions or uh, migrant uh, workers, uh, agriculture workers, uh, 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 accommodations or, or meatpacking plants and so on, where we've seen outbreaks of, of the disease. Um, we've been essentially binary. Initially, it was stay home or you'll die. We, we then moved from that and we're in the position where, well, we'll see what happens with the trends. If they go up, then our response is, is automatically locked down and subsidized. Um, this, is, um, this is the wrong way of doing it. What we need to do is we need to enlist Canadians and say, uh, we're not powerless. We do, each of us have the capacity to make a difference if, if government, business, and individuals all do our parts, we can get our lives back sooner and we can avoid this 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 yo-yo effect that's so devastating on, on business and on families as well. Um, there's no silver bullet here. The best thing will be the, uh, the vaccine, but it will take you know the government's best estimate and things haven't been going all that well on the rollout, but their best estimate is that we will be up to where people who, who want vaccines will have been vaccinated by early fall. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, others are doing much better than we are on that. But in the meantime, what we need to do is to, to say, well, how do we control the spread of the disease? Well, some of it is by uh, physical distancing, others by PPEs, um, you know, wearing masks and so on, um, plexiglass in, in stores and around cashiers and so on. Um, but another is, is testing. Um, and none of these by itself contains the disease. Uh, people use the analogy to Swiss cheese with the holes in them. But if you take many slices of Swiss cheese and stack them on top of each other, you eventually block uh, all, of those, all of those holes. One of those slices is, is rapid testing. And um, it's not perfect. It's... Um, uh, its efficacy is less than, than the slow tests that we're, that we're used to, but it's better than nothing, much better than nothing. And to the extent to which we can identify uh, people who have disease early, 
Uh, we can isolate them, we can test and trace, and we can contain the disease much more successfully. Also, from the perspective of, uh, of businesses, if you're running a restaurant and you're able to say our staff is, is rap rapid tested every day, uh, this will do wonders in terms of uh, improving the confidence of customers coming back in as well. Um, the government has procured millions and you know they were slow in, in approving rapid testing, the federal government, but they've procured millions and millions of kits. These are sitting in warehouses. They are not being distributed and used at this point. Um, one of the issues is that uh, is that the kits that they've bought have tended to be the earlier version where uh, where it's more testing your brain than it is the the front of your nose. Uh, newer tests are uh, are uh, more user friendly. Uh, some of the provinces have decided they don't want to use it. BC has said they don't want to use it. Uh, um, Quebec is looking at at divesting themselves of the kits. This is crazy stuff, and what we've got is this this crazy quilt of different approaches taken across the country instead of having any sort of coherent national strategy. So um, we need to have, uh, we need to roll out rapid testing as rapidly as possible. And we need to understand how we're going to use it. The question is, um, if, if a business makes extensive use of, of rapid testing, what does this mean in terms of future lockdowns? Does it have any impact? On the government's decisions, um, we need to know what are the protocols here, and and what's what's the government's strategy. I have not seen a strategy as yet coming from from government on it. Um, the other point I'd make, Craig, is that is that um, we need much better data. Uh, it is astonishing to me how poor the data is that we have in terms of the rate of transmission um, and our ability to trace as well. Um, as a result, then politicians. I'll tell you something you don't know. As a, as a former politician, I'll, I'll share, a, share a trade secret. And that's that the public calls up politicians and says, there's a crisis. We need you to do something. Well, the question is, well, what? Something. Politicians then do something. And too often, it has no relationship at all to, to what needs to be done. So uh, we didn't have data showing that, that restaurants were the major source of transmission of COVID. Uh, yet the, the instinctive reaction of the politicians, well, we'll shut them down. So what did we have? We drove people into private homes. Instead of having them in, in restaurants where, uh, you know, where there was proper social distancing and people wearing PPP, PPEs and so on, what you had was people meeting in private homes. Um, if, you know, there were Super Bowl parties in, in Waterloo region, would they have been safer in a restaurant following proper protocols or with people cramming into somebody's basement? Um, it, so, so what you get is, is decisions being made that are perverse. We need much better data and the decisions that we make have to be, have to be based on data. An issue that, that, that you've been very concerned about is the treatment of small retailers. It is, you know, is it better to shut down all the small retailers and to force people to line up and to jam into large big box stores than it would be to have them in a smaller store where you had two or three people in the store at the time? Is that safer? Or would we be, be better having a different strategy? We have to be data driven. Testing, uh, testing will improve that data but it will also help to protect people until such time as we, uh, it, it, as, uh, we get a vaccine. The, I've gone on a long time, but let me make just one more point. We're in a race against time. We are seeing the outbreak of new um, strains of the disease, which are far more virulent. And we are running the risk that, um, that we could be facing a third wave. We're, we're seeing infection rates coming down quite dramatically right now as a result of lockdowns. Uh, you can't transmit it if everybody's locked in their in their home. Um, but uh, governments now are starting to ease off and say, okay, we've got it under control, so we're we're letting people back out. This could be the point in the tsunami where the water pulls back and everything seems terribly calm before the wave hits. Um, if we are dealing with with much more uh, dangerous, strains of the vaccine, which are displacing the, the initial strain, 
uh, we could be seeing a third wave that that is tougher even than from the first ones. So we need desperately to get people vaccinated as rapidly as possible to contain the um, the audience that 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 can be infected uh, by these strains and to to prevent uh, that third tsunami wave from uh, from hitting us. Today, we don't sequence sufficiently the uh, the uh, DNA of people who have the disease. So we don't even know how prevalent these uh, these strains are. Uh, there was some of this done in the last week in the Toronto area, which found 100 cases of it in one daily sample. That's just scratching the surface. So uh, we need much better data. Yeah, uh, you know, <clears throat> I was always, you know, a little bit concerned about the, the school reopenings and things like that when they're you know, you, you hear reports coming from, you know, uh, I would say valid scientists saying uh, that, um, you know, the asymptomatics are, are largely younger people and, and, uh, and, and students, especially with the new variants. And, you know, my concern has always been that, um, you know, their public health was always saying, well, the workplace is the problem. The workplace is a problem. That's why we got to close the doors of the workplace. And yet, you know, they, they kept rejecting the fact that maybe these kids were asymptomatic, bringing it home from school and giving it to mom and dad and mom and dad were taking it on their merry way to, to work and sharing it at lunch. And, uh, you know, I think, I think they certainly in school settings where there is uh, some fairly strong scientific evidence that, you know, younger people will, will tend to be more uh, inclined to be asymptomatic. We need to have that testing in schools if we're going to keep the kids in schools, but more importantly, um, or as importantly, keep the businesses open as well. Yeah, it, it, the, the evidence shows that where there is proper, proper, where there are proper processes in place and people are using PPEs and so on, um, it's been pretty well controlled. Everybody understood that if you started bring, bringing people back into groups, including schools, that we would see some increase in disease. But we, what we have not seen is the explosion that many of us feared that, that there might be. And certainly if we look at it from a business point of view, one of the things that's gonna be critical to, to reopening the economy is that our schools stay open. Um, uh, women carry the, the majority of the work still in terms of raising families. And if we want to be able to have women coming back into the workforce, uh, they're going to have to have uh, both affordable childcare and, uh, and schools back uh, operating as well. So we need to do that, but we need to do it, do it well. And we need to have data, obviously, to, to inform our, our decisions. Yeah, interesting. Um, you mentioned a little bit about uh, the vaccine and I, you know, it's, uh, it is very concerning to people. There's um, a, a lot of people are, are wondering what's going on. The prime minister stands in front of the Rideau cottage and says, one thing, and then his ministers or senior bureaucrats seem to say something else later in the afternoon. You know, I think he said the other day they were going to get two million uh, uh, doses or twenty million doses from Moderna, and uh, uh, it came back in the afternoon. No, we're going to get twenty million doses between Moderna and and Pfizer. Um, so, I think you know the concern is as you look on the data charts around the world. And you've got Israel that's probably at about 60% of their population has now been vaccinated, at least with one dose. Um, and they're well on their way to, you know, probably I could, you know, you, maybe smarter minds than I could guess better, but I would say by the end of March, they're gonna reach their level of potential herd immunity. We are now 49th in the world in per capita vaccinations. Um, you know, they're even pointing there, you know, we can't manufacture vaccines and it's wonderful that we've started down that path once again, but what is the problem here um, from your understanding and your perspective, you know, has the government failed us? Um, are the manufacturers of vaccines failing us? Is it because Canada is only 35 million people? What's the big deal? Um, what, what's the issue here with the vaccines from your perspective? Well, the first thing, the, the, the first element has its roots going back to the 1970s when the federal government made the decision to focus on price of pharmaceuticals as opposed to ensuring that we had a Canadian industry. And uh, they promoted the generic sector 
and uh, were looking at what they could do to drive down prices. The brand name manufacturers said, look, this is making it unaffordable for us to continue in Canada. They started pulling back out of, of Canada. We've allowed the sector to atrophy. This is a story, uh, Greg, that that any manufacturers who are on this call understand very well. You allow your manufacturing base to atrophy because of negligence or because it seems easier to go somewhere else and you pay a price down the down the road. So so we are wholly dependent on uh, on foreign supply at this point. Um, but other countries are as well. It's interesting that Israel, who, who topped the list in terms of vaccination, is importing it from abroad. So they negotiated contracts early and they were prepared to pay whatever price was required to be able to get their hands on what they wanted. Um, it all comes down to the contracts at the end of the day. Um, when did you negotiate the contract? What priority are you um, uh, with what you've negotiated? And then the other thing that we're dealing with is of course, pandemic protectionism on the part of other countries. Um, there was a suggestion that, that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau should call President Biden and say, uh, hey, uh, you've got that Pfizer plant in Michigan. Why don't you, uh, instead of using this on Americans, why don't you just send it across the border to Ontario and use it in Cambridge instead? How likely do you think it is that any politician is going to say, yeah, I'll deny access when I have an exclusive contract at this point. Uh, I'll give that up and send it to uh, to another country. Not very, not very likely. And, and what we're seeing with the European Union then um, is them looking at intervening in contracts and saying, uh, before you give it to any Canadian, we want it, we want it to uh, uh, to be distributed here in Europe. We're left very vulnerable as a result. And so there, there are a couple of lessons here. The first is we need to send a very direct message to our friends, the Europeans, that we do have contracts. And we expect those contracts to be honored fully and that you remember your friends when they stand with you when you need them and you remember them when they don't. Uh, and then two, when this is all over, what we need is a royal commission to look at what we did right and what we did wrong. Uh, I'm not interested in a blame assigning exercise, but I'm interested in, in you know, the military after any uh, operation does a postmortem where they where they look at what are the lessons learned. We need to say, what have we learned from this? Well, I think one of the things that we've learned is that we, um, the single most important responsibility of any government is, the, is national security, broadly writ, the security of its people. And we should define national security very broadly. It's not simply, are we gonna be invaded by the Russians? It's also, do we have security supply of energy? Uh, do we have the medical equipment, the pharmaceuticals that we may need for future pandemics? You know, how are we prepared if there is a climate disaster of some sort? Um, what is it that we what is it that we need to maintain here at home to be able to prepare for contingencies in the future? And how well uh, are we prepared? It was stunning that that with our stockpiles, just before the pandemic hit, we gave a whole pile of the stockpile away. Um, now, the, it had notionally expired. It was past the best before date. But we didn't give stuff to other people, the Chinese in this instance, um, among others, um, that, that was useless. It was still useful. And it certainly would have been useful to our people. We were desperate for it uh, very shortly. What is our, what is our planning and, and uh, how are we preparing for this? This sort of, a, of an arm's length review could, could look at a whole range of issues like this, including how do we ensure that we have an industrial base in Canada that allows us in times of crisis to meet our needs? Yeah, you know, I think back to when SARS, uh, you know, was, was the talk of the day back in the early 2000s. And, and uh, there were a number of things. In fact, one of, the, one of the items, and we're working on now as a group here at our Best Waterloo group that, that you know, we're channeling uh, as much effort as we possibly can uh, to government, but also to, um, uh, to individuals in our community. But it came up that there was a, a report done after SARS. And, and in there, it really said, um, take steps and initiatives. Don't, don't wait for the clinical trials. And it was more speaking about, about, you know, masks and testing and all of those kinds of things, as opposed to, um, uh, 
you know, waiting for that all that data to come forward. You need to be reactionary and you need to implement measures uh, that that you believe are going to help bring it down. And, but it seems that we didn't learn those lessons or forgot and put that report on a shelf somewhere and and basically ignored it because you know there were some lessons learned. I can remember all kinds of companies instituting pandemic plans at that point. And I, and I fear this, Perrin, and you talk about having a Royal Commission afterwards to review it and, and, and then come out with best practices from that point on. I fear that after this goes away, you know, we become comfortable and if nothing else comes along, you know, because I, I would venture to say that 80 to 90% of those pandemic plans that all these businesses and governments had only got about 50 or 75% way through the process. And then they put them on the shelves and forgot about them. How are, is a Royal Commission the only way we're going to have to be able to say, no, this is going to be fixed in stone. This is going to be part of government procedure and we're going to carry it right through to the end. Yeah, there, there are a couple of, of dangers here, Greg. The, the first is that we simply roll over and go back to sleep. That was awful. We're through it. Good night. Um, which is essentially what we did after SARS. Um, yes, there was there was a review done internally, which didn't spark a public uh, a public debate, and had a number of the recommendations of that review been followed, we would have been better better prepared. There's no doubt about that. Um, it, this needs to be a very public exercise, and um, we we must not allow ourselves the uh, the uh, luxury of simply moving on to the next issue. Um, the other danger is, is that we become generals fighting the last war. Um, it's not SARS that we should, should be preparing for, and it's not COVID that we should be preparing for as we do this review. It's what is the next crisis? It could be a climate disaster. It, it could be a much more, much more virulent uh, 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 germ that we're dealing with, pandemic. Um, and we need to be prepared for contingencies that, that, are, that look quite different from what we've dealt with. Um, you know, if we look back, back at SARS, I was uh, working out of CME's office in Mississauga at the time, and Toronto was the epicenter for SARS. And I remember going down to, to the subway at, at, at King, and, and you could have fired a, a cannon off there and not hit anybody. Uh, it, it looked sort of post-apocalyptic. I thought, I'll never see something quite like this again in my lifetime. Well, in comparison, um, SARS was nothing in, in comparison to what we're dealing with with, uh, with COVID. And we may very well look back on COVID and say, uh, COVID was really a warning for us of, of something far more dangerous that's yet to come. And it was a warning to get prepared for that. Um, we should heed that warning and, and use, it, uh, use, it, use it well. Yeah. Uh, Perrin, um, I'm getting down to my last questions, and then I'll open it up for some questions from uh, our see the audience. Come in, I'm glad to. <laughs> my easy questions. You'll get the tough questions from everybody else, but um, this is a this is a monumental disruption in the labor force in Canada. Obviously, we know that. I think it was uh, 212 or 220 thousand jobs. You know, was the last. Uh, lost uh, was the last report that came out. Um, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce has been very strong um, in uh, immigration policies and making sure that we're ready for the advancement of, of our economy and that we know uh, we are going to rely on immigration, strong economic immigration policies to be able to drive our economy forward. How, how, is, how is industry and the government going to deal with this fallout and how are we going to get back to normal? Um, and, and how is immigration also going to play a part in the advancement of the Canadian economy? Immigration is going to continue to be a, a very important part in our advancement, um, both in terms of specific skills that we'll need in the future, but also just in terms of what immigrants bring to Canada in terms of the sense of entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, in our region, if you look at a company like Linamar, in, in Guelph, where Frank Hasenfratz, you know, immigrated, opened up a small machine shop, 
And now you look at all of the, the jobs and the economic uh, activity that Linamar uh, generates. That's an example of, uh, of the value to us. Um, what, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about what, what's the permanent legacy of SARS? Well, one of it is that, that it's going to have an, a permanent impact, I believe, on the nature of work. Uh, it has been very disruptive. And one of the things we're going to be needing to look at is what jobs are going to be permanently lost as a result of, uh, of, of COVID. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, in manufacturing, where people have been concerned about how do I keep the plant open uh, during a pandemic, there's an incentive there to substitute machinery for labor as a result. Uh, that's going to affect in some areas, it's going to affect uh, jobs and the nature of work. As we digitize, digitalization is going to demand different skill sets from, from what manual labor would uh, without it. Um, how do we retrain people? And particularly, how do you retrain people who are in their 50s or 60s uh, to be able to, to um, cope with the, with the new economy? Um, We've seen, you know, one of the one of the great surprises, uh, at least to me, from from all of this, have been the explosion of people buying homes out in the country because they've discovered they can work from Muskoka or or wherever. Um, that's exciting stuff, and it means that that we've melted geography, and that that no matter how remote you are in the country, not only can you get services, but you can participate in the workforce anywhere in the world. That's exciting. Uh, but it also means something else. It means you're in competition for that job with somebody in New Delhi or San Francisco or Sydney, Australia or, or Brussels, Belgium. Um, the nature of the economy is, is changing as a, as a result of this and the nature of work as well. So we need to do a lot of work and we need to do it quickly to, to look at uh, what are the permanent changes here. Uh, where do we need as educators or as businesses or as, uh, as uh, governments to, uh, to change our processes and, and to make improvements? And uh, how do we prepare for this, for this new future? Uh, there's no going back. Uh, the, the one option we don't have is to, to think that things are going to look like they looked in February of 2000. They're not. Um, We're going to move ahead to a different future. It will look much more like the like the one that we had previously than it does right now, but uh, but it isn't going to be the same as it as it was. And we need to go, you know, to to use the the famous Gret, Gretzky analogy. We need to go where the puck is going. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Our friend uh, Jan De Silva, Toronto Board of Trade, and I had a conversation. You know, some time ago. I think it was actually back in the fall. And you know, there's a real concern about the displacement of the workforce in, especially in metropolitan areas. I think at that point she had said that, you know, uh, only about uh, 20 or 30 percent of the workforce had returned back to work in downtown Toronto, yeah. which led to the collapse of a tremendous amount of small businesses that are in the underground system there and, you know, the little restaurants and things like that that were serving 100% of that workforce that was coming in every single day. If that's a trend in the future, if we cannot expect uh, 100% of that return, um, there's an entire shift in, in you know, investment portfolios from big companies that are building office towers and, and, and then those very companies on where they gather their workforce from. I think it's I think it, you know, even if it's a, even if it's a, a few percentage points, it's going to make a huge difference in, you know, the local economies in most communities, and they need to be prepared for that. Well, it, it's a, it is a great opportunity, I think, for a place like Cambridge. Um, you know, put yourself in the position of somebody running a, a company in one of those giant office towers, where the goal previously had been, how do we bring all of our workforce together in one place? And then you discover that uh, this is a terrible idea, um, that in getting people up to the 60th floor with two people in an elevator at a time, that it's going to take hours to get your, your workforce there. You'll be thinking, well, how do I plan for the future? Well, first of all, should I be paying the real estate prices in downtown 
Toronto. Maybe there's a cheaper way of doing it and we can distribute the workforce. And maybe it, it uh, makes sense to use lower rise buildings. And maybe Cambridge, which isn't far from Toronto, would be a very good place for us to take some of our workforce and put them in a facility there where the quality of life is so high and the cost of living is lower. Um, there are gonna be a lot of decisions made about, um, about how businesses are organized and about the nature of work itself. And it means that, that those of us in the chamber movement um, should be looking at what are the implications for our communities and for our, for our members. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's going to be a real changing dynamic, I think, and it's going to be very interesting to, to watch how some companies navigate through this. Because I know a couple of our members are saying, you know, gee, I'm paying, uh, you know, $100,000 a year for my office space. And we're seemingly as productive with a remote workforce. Um, why would I be spending $100,000 on office space? And you know, maybe yep. I need to think differently about that. And, and uh, maybe it's, a, it's not so much that it's cheaper, maybe it's more effective for them. Yeah, I, uh, one of the interviews that I, I did for the program that we put on the web, the Business of Business, was with the heads of one of the, the banks in Montreal. And he said, uh, what we've been able to do is open our branches in the rural areas. What we haven't been able to do is to bring people back to head office. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, it gets you thinking about the, the nature of organization and, um, and how you pandemic proof the, uh, the business for the future. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, because I, I often tell people, you know, if a year ago, I'd have said to my staff, okay, you know, who wants to work from home? Everybody's hands would have gone up. They all want to work from home. Now they all want to come back to work um, because they miss that interaction that, you know, getting up every morning. I had another member tell me he couldn't get used to working from home. It was driving him crazy too close to the refrigerator and too close to the TV <laughs> or whatever the case may be. Um, or the dog was running through. It's, the, it's under the dog. The the yeah. It's always the dog and the kids, but so what he does now is he actually gets up every morning, he has a shower, he gets dressed, he puts his suit on or his jacket on, he gets in his car and he drives over to Starbucks, he gets a coffee and then comes back home and he feels like he went to work. And, you know, little things like that have changed his whole mental attitude uh, because he's now prepared and ready to start work and, and he's got a more effective day ahead. Well, and, and the other thing is is getting away from it. Uh, one of the, the great impacts of COVID and working from home has been stress and the mental impacts that it's had. Um, the fact is we're all living over the store today and work and private life blur. Uh, one of the reasons why people are, are getting sheds in their backyard and putting an office in there is to physically separate themselves. That They close a door at the end of the day and say, this is it. I have some time in my life for, for myself as well. So um, we're learning a whole lot about the nature of work as a, as a result of this and, and, uh, and about ourselves just really as human beings. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that could be really good things too. Uh, it, in the end, when it's, you know, everything's uh, taken care of, maybe, maybe those will be good lessons learned and, and it'll start a new process forward that'll help build little communities like Cambridge will become more prosperous because we've got more people coming into the community and, uh, uh, I know Scott Higgins, who's on here, he's from a, a large development firm in the area called Hip Developments, and they build, they're building a $150 million development down in Cambridge. He, ha he was on last week on our chamber chat as they are my guest and talked about uh, social capitalism being the way forward, where you're, you got to build communities that are fun because people need a little fun in their lives now, because all of a sudden home may be hasn't necessarily become the fun place that it was because it's the workplace now. So, uh, but I, but I think it's, it's interesting and, uh, and how maybe, maybe from Scott's perspective, how um, it changes the mindset of developers on how they can participate in the, in the housing crisis and prov pr providing housing for uh, in different types of settings that are fun uh, but uh, but yet meet the overall objective of creating some affordable housing. Scott, I don't know whether you want to make uh, some comment on that or ask Karen about that, but um, it, uh, it it was an interesting discussion that we had. Scott? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to, Greg. So, I mean, the one premise is, as you said, Perrin, the dispersion of the workforce. You know, cities are going to compete now based on, in my view, it's sort of bring your own city now instead of bring your own device. You can pick wherever you want to go. So what are the cities doing to attract talent outside of conventional infrastructure? Um, urban placemaking, interesting activities. How much fun can you have in a city for free is, is Ken Greenberg's mantra always. And, and it's pretty true. And I think it'll be more relevant as we go forward. So it'll be interesting, as Greg and I talked about, bringing a group of business leaders together through the chamber that talk about investments in community. It was always the private sector that made the biggest impact on civic infrastructure. It was never municipalities. Municipalities are taxed uh, to great lengths in, in the deployment of their own capital right now. So we as businesses might need to start to refocus on, on making our cities uh, a more enjoyable place to live in hopes of attracting the talent we need and, and, and the opportunity that's there to attract that talent for exactly what you said, because they're not going back to the 60th floor of TD Tower. Um, so there's a whole discussion happening on what the business community can do as city builders uh, that then start to advance wanting to live there and really taking almost a Nordic or Scandinavian approach to economic development. And just curious what your thoughts are on that potential trend going forward. Yeah, I think, it, I think that, that trend was already there prior to COVID, but I think COVID accelerates that again. And, and that, that to me, by the way, in a number of different areas, that's been the impact of the pandemic. It's not that, that it's created something that's entirely new, but rather it's taken some trends that were already in place and accelerated them. Uh, if you look at millennials, um, they're interested in quality of life considerations and work. And the old criterion about, you know, there's your desk, there's your, there's your paycheck, be happy. Uh, doesn't apply anymore. They're they're looking to to decide whether is this something I feel good about doing as well. So quality of life considerations are going to increasingly drive decisions that people are making and affect the uh, the economy, both in the nature of work and in consumer choices that people make. And I don't see that as a bad thing. I see that as a as a good thing that we um, will be looking beyond the balance sheet at at taking a more holistic approach about the role of business in society um, and uh, how we ensure that that communities are good people, good places for people to, to live, to raise families and to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why I think you know, Waterloo Region is, is so incredibly well positioned. The, the quality of life is superb. Your, your educational institutions are excellent. You are within an easy commute of, uh, of the greatest population center in Canada and easy to get to the United States as well. Um, this could be a tremendous boon for the community in, in, in my view. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, I can remember years ago um, meeting uh, Jerry from Ben and Jerry's and, you know, largely a hippie and didn't wear deodorant. That was the one thing that really struck me with him. But um, but was what was interesting in conversing with him is he talking about his business model and saying, you know, that every one of their franchisees had to have two balance sheets, one that they had to report to head office. One was their balance sheet on their, obviously their financial um, outcomes, but then their second balance sheet had to match um, the financial outcomes and it had to be their social impact on the community in which they uh, they they ran their businesses in. And I think, you know, at that time, I thought the guy was uh, a, a bit loony, but let's face it, Ben and Jerry's have built, you know, a pretty remarkable institution um, developing an ice cream com company in, in Burlington, Vermont, um, where, you know, er, in their early days, they thought this it was great because they were selling ice cream like crazy. And then fall came and nobody was buying ice cream and they couldn't understand why their product was not as appetizing in the middle of winter in Burlington, Vermont. But, but you know, I think we're starting to see that come along. And and younger development companies le led by you know young folks like Scott Higgins are are saying no. The, this the social capital in our community is critically important to me having success as a developer in building this community. And I think we're seeing more and more of those companies and leaders of those companies saying. 
uh, that the balance sheet needs to be almost equal with respect to economic outcome of the company and the social value that we're contributing to the community. In some way, in some way, Greg, we're coming full circle. Um, you know, my hometown's Fergus, and Fergus was very similar to to Hessler in the sense foundries and and uh, uh, factories. Uh, my family made washing machines, and made farm equipment, and and uh, household appliances, and so on. When the depression struck, my grandfather kept one breadwinner from every family in town on the payroll. He felt it was his obligation. He said, uh, the folks on the line are responsible for the success of the company, and we've got to be with them during the hard times. Uh, he had a new car he had just bought. He put it up in blocks in the garage and said, until a guy on the line can afford to drive to work, I won't either. Um, he, uh, at the height of the Depression, he... Uh, would come out in the middle of the night. He would walk up to the factory and walk around because they had gone to shift. They were on shift work. Um, he caught one one chap who was stealing uh, coal from the from the furnace to take home. Could have called the police. Instead, he said, uh, uh, "This will damage your furnace." And he arranged to have a ton of coal delivered to that guy's house the next day. Why? It's because he felt that that business was more than a bottom line that there is such a thing as corporate citizenship and that you have an obligation to put back into the community and that you benefit uh, as a direct result of that as well. Uh, if you take a more holistic view of, of, of the role of the business, um, I think we're coming more back to that, to that sort of, um, of a view of the role of business that, that you are, you do have an interest in the well-being of your employees and of your customers and of the community at large. And that's where Chambers of Commerce play such a key role. Uh, so much of the uh, activity of, of Chambers of Commerce isn't spent talking about public policy issues. It's planning the Santa Claus parade or looking about how you beautify uh, Main Street um, or what you can do to, to have community events that, that just make it exciting and fun to be part of the community. Um, why does it? Why does the community? Why does the Chamber of Commerce do it? It does it for two reasons. The the first is because it believes it's the right thing to do, but the second is it's good business at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What what uh, a great way to end the session on. But I do want to give you one moment to speak about uh, the Canadian Chambers hosting um, uh, a program, an incredible program next week called Canada Three Hundred and Sixty Economic Summit. Um, and it's open to anyone. You can go to cha chamber.ca and you'll find the link there to register. Parent, give me a highlight on a couple of the, the sessions that are going to happen uh, through this event. Um, we're going to be having a large number of CEOs. It, it'll be very focused on, on um, a business-led recovery for Canada. Where do we go from here? And what we want to do is to be forward-focused, not not navel gazing, not complaining, but rather looking at uh, at uh, how can we come back stronger. Uh, the leader of the opposition uh, uh, will be uh, closing off the session. We've invited Christa Freeland. I don't believe that we've heard from her or from uh, Francois Philippe Champagne as yet as to as to their availability. But we're hoping that one of them will kick off. Uh, the day. And then we'll have a number of very senior CEOs from across Canada who will be participating on a wide range of issues related to, to sectors and to some of the challenges we're facing and, and where we go. The, the point of Canada 360 is to sort of pop our head above the water so we can survey what it looks like and, and uh, start making plans as a business community for, for the year ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, I actually had asked Perrin, when I asked him to join us here, um, I had said either the, the 10th or the 17th, and he said, well, I can't do the 17th because we have Canada 360, and by the way, um, you should be on that program, and I had already registered. He didn't know that, but I had already registered, uh, so I'm going to be there, but I may miss, miss uh, some of the opening remarks uh, because we're having our uh, chamber chat next week as well. But I encourage everybody to go to chamber.ca, have a look at it, um, and uh, maybe consider it uh, for your day next Wednesday, because I think there'll be some, uh, there's always valuable uh, contributions from um, the senior leadership in our country uh, through the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. But no more better value than the Honorable Perrin Beattie coming on to Chamber Chat on a Wednesday. 
and uh, uh, in, in lifting our spirits with his wisdom and his uh, uh, camaraderie. And he's just a, a true ambassador for business for the, for the country. And I am so honored to have him as a colleague. Um, you, uh, you just can't imagine how great it is to be able to work with uh, uh, such a dominant uh, uh, business leader in our country. So Perrin, thank you very much for this morning. Thanks, thanks very much, Greg. You know that I've always admired you as a judge of character. <laughs> I know, and I was really happy you didn't mention anything about my hair. And Julie does a wonderful job of yours, but don't give Lisa any ideas because uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a little afraid of that. So mine is mine gets easier and easier to do as, as time goes by. Unfortunately, <laughs> listen. Thank you all. Thank you all very very much. Thank you for your engagement in the in in the local chamber. But thank you also for being here today and for all you're doing for the Canadian economy. Uh, we're just very proud to be able to work with you. Thanks very much. Have a great Wednesday, folks.